the name of the living and loving God, who is Creator, Christ and Holy Spirit. Amen. Who is my neighbor? Who is your neighbor? In this message from Deuteronomy, there's a tone of pastoral care. Um, the author puts Moses' words there, basically saying it's going to be okay. You're going to do well. Things will turn out okay. Moses encourages the Hebrews to be faithful to the law of Yahweh with these words. The word is very near to you. It is on your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. Saying it's right there. It's available to you anytime you need it and want it. And basically what he's quoting here is from the Shema, which uh, is stated earlier in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy and is a daily prayer for Jews to this day. Um, and it pops up again and again, and actually a part of it is in this 30th chapter of Deuteronomy, which you just heard. But the, the, the phrase, the, the core of that prayer is this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And that's what Moses is talking about, as well as the Ten Commandments, as well as the other scriptures, as well as the worship of, in the Hebrew tradition, as well as the customs. Put it all together and saying, it's, it's there for you folks. You will be challenged, but as a faith community, who will go through challenges, you'll be okay if you just remember and follow the law. Then in the order in which we heard the readings comes that, that passage from Paul's letter to the Colossians and the church there. And, and remember those early churches, Paul established some of them and then he, he was pastor or mentor to a lot more of them, and they were trying times. Christianity was just in its beginning stages to work out the theology and sort of how they live into really now that Jesus is, the physical Jesus is gone. So they needed some encouragement, and so Paul was good at that. He was saying it's going to be okay. Paul encouraged them with the, to be faithful to the gospel and to the example of Christ Jesus with these words. We have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And what we've got to remember is that in those early centuries of Christianity, not that we are now, but they were serious about praying because that's what Jesus taught them to do as a way to stay connected to God the Father and connected to each other. It was truly a spiritual connection among those churches and within those churches. So he assured, Paul assured them, we're praying for you. It's not just you're in our prayers and thoughts. It's we are praying for you. Another pastoral word of encouragement. And then comes the Gospel reading, the story of the Good Samaritan, which clearly is the most known, well-known, and used and read parable, I think, of them all. Um, loads of, I mean, we talk about Samaritan ministry in, in downtown D.C. That was a very active nonprofit, Samaritan ministry. There's even in legal status a Good Samaritan Act. I mean, there's that whole concept of, of Compassion is, is very familiar. And so the way it's set up is that the, the lawyer who wants answers and wants specific answers that can be followed uh, says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I mean, after I die, tell me. I, I need to know. I, can, I want to write it down. And Jesus says, well, what is written in the law? Referring to the same thing that Moses was talking about, but more. And the lawyer says, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. See how so similar that sounds? And your neighbor as yourself, which Jesus adds in this case. 
And Jesus says, well, you've got the right answer. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer's not satisfied. He basically says, I need more information. And the lawyer says, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then after he hears that, Jesus says, well, tell me, who do you think among those three people, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, which one of those do you think is the neighbor? And the lawyer says, well, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus says, you're right. Go and do likewise. So, again, we're talking about encouragement. Jesus is encouraging the lawyer who is persistent in getting more d detailed answers. Say, you can do it. You know, you've got the right answer. Yes, it is a Samaritan. Go and be like that Samaritan. So it's very interesting we have one, two, three messages of encouragement. The pastoral message. But what is often missed in talking about the parable of the Good Samaritan is the fact that the Good Samaritan was a Samaritan. And not much is said about the fact that Samaritan and Jews hated each other, literally hated, despised each other, because the Samaritans, Samaria was between um, uh, Judea and Galilee. And so in the travels, and we actually a few Sundays ago had a story of Jesus going um, through Samaritan, through Samaria, which was a gutsy thing for a Jew to do because the Samaritans really despised Jews. But he did it anyway to make a point that the, God, that the word of Jesus was going to Samaria as well as to the Jewish world. Um, but the Jews didn't like the Samaritans because they weren't really fully Jewish. You know, so if you didn't live into the law fully, you were really not a Jew. The Samaritans were the result of people who came into that part of the, the, area, the Sumerian area um, during the exile. And they were pagans. They had no Jewish heritage, no Jewish history, no G Jewish learning, Hebrew learning. Um, so they were total foreigners who did not honor or observe fully the Hebrew ways. They did, they did read the first five Bibles of Scripture. Um, they did have some of the customs, but they really didn't measure up to the Jewish standard. And so the Jews didn't respect them at all. And the Samaritans didn't like the Jews because they didn't respect them, you know? It was one of those, it was one of those hate things and they really couldn't move beyond it. And so the twist here is, after hearing a word of encouragement about acts of compassion, that's a good thing, and certainly at the heart of Jesus' message, love one another, after acts of compassion being the focus, if you go just a little bit deeper, there is an act of justice because the Samaritans were not treated justly as much as the Jews were. And yet the message of Jesus was that of God that God reached out to and accepted all humans who chose to be children of God. That's a message that is not, that goes beyond this religious and racial barrier between the Samaritans and the Jews. It's a new message. It's a message of Jesus. It's a message of inclusion. So an act of compassion by Jesus, the pastor, becomes an act of justice by Jesus, the prophet. And in a really neat, tidy kind of sense, that includes both, both halves of the fullness of our faith in Jesus Christ, both pastor and prophet. You know, it's a whole lot easier to talk about the pastor part, 
Because we as humans naturally want to be loved and want to love. We as humans are created to be connected with each other. Some are, some are introverts and some are extroverts. Some, for some it comes easy, for some we have to work at. But that is a human characteristic, is to connect and to be with other people. And so to support that pastoral compassion approach fits. It's harder to talk about the prophetic justice part, justice part, because probably all of us have to work on that to some degree or another. For many of us, it just doesn't come naturally. And yet it is clearly a part of our faith in Jesus Christ. I want to lift up uh, a couple of examples of how compassion and justice can work together. Um, one is common threads. It's, there's something about it in your bulletin. Um, and, and really one of the, if you, if you look at the, the elements of our mission, this, this is St. James and First Baptist. We're called to become friends in Christ, to let God guide us, to honor our differences and celebrate our common threads, uh, to do something good for the community, and, and to work for racial unity in order to build community. So you see, even in that mission statement for a ministry of this parish combines the compassion and the justice. That's a good thing. And it's also more difficult to manage. As is stated in the bulletin, we will be giving out signs that you might have seen around that say, home, hate has no home here, um, which is a justice statement. It can be applied to hate between races, hate between genders, hate between ages, hate between economic status, hate between cultures, hate be between gender identity, you name it. But Jesus stands for inclusion and love and compassion towards everyone. And in order for us to get, for us to get there, it does include some justice work, some listening to each other, and so discerning exactly what is the justice that God calls for in this specific example. Another example that I'm really excited about is um, what our young people talked about last Sunday and what Chris Working talked about very eloquently, I thought, and that is crossing that barrier between people with money and people without money, people with homes and people without ho homes. It's another space where it's a hard conversation to have, and yet Jesus leads us into that same conversation, and as those high school students um, stated, and Chris, the magic here is that when we get into those conversations and have those, develop those relationships, even if it's just 15 minutes, it changes our heart to some degree and we can feel that this is moving in an area where more justice will be brought about. So I have a reflection question for you. Two minutes, two minutes. Here's a question. Who is someone who lives within your sphere in your life, but from whom you are separated by some sort of barrier? One of those barriers that I've been talking about. I know everybody has someone that can relate to that. Who is someone that lives in your sphere, maybe in your family, maybe in your neighborhood, whatever, but there's a barrier between you and them? And what action does, that, does this parable encourage you to take in order, or to consider, in order, to, in order for there to be a mutual healing, in order for there to be justice and wholeness? Can you think of one person that you feel separated from? Can you think of how this parable might speak to you so that the two of you could have a healed relationship, especially if it has to do with one of those social barriers. Please think about that for two minutes.
Amen.